So we're gonna have a jolly romp through Lady C's book, Harry and Meghan, The Real Story today. And of course she goes right back to the beginning of their early childhoods and it's a fascinating insight because you can see their characters forming and, and uh, what sort of person they were developing into, which is fascinating. But one thing she did, did say that grabbed my attention was that Harry was primed to fall in love with someone like Meghan by his mum, Diana. And I don't know a lot about Diana other than the public image because I haven't read this yet, Diana in private, Lady Colin Campbell, the real story, I'm going to get into that. It's, I'm sure it's very juicy. But she does sort of illustrate why she thinks this is true. She more or less points out that Megan shares a lot of Diana's characteristics, but not necessarily any of the good ones. <laughs> so all the bad ones she shares. One of the ones she uses as an example is the fact that Diana used to ghost people. She used to discard family and friends. Um, often they would not know why. They would be on the outer, they would get the cold shoulder and they wouldn't know what had happened or why or what they'd done. And as we know, Megan in the Urban Dictionary um, is that to be Megan Markle is to be ghosted or discarded when you're of no further use. I should say before I go on, in the interest of fairness, that there is another uh, definition in the Urban Dictionary of Megan Markle now, and it's about valuing your mental health and leaving a situation when you're not being appreciated or valued for your authentic self. So which one do you think is more relevant? The, the looking after your mental health and not being valued and appreciated for your authentic self? Or the one about ghosting people and discarding them when they no longer are any use to you? Hmm, tough decision. Let me know in the comments down below. The other thing that was really interesting about Lady C's book was the fact that there had been discussion with Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth about the prospect of Harry marrying Meghan. And from Harry's book, I sort of got the impression that other than bumping into the Queen and the curtsy thing at Royal Lodge, an afternoon tea with the Queen that actually went very well and Harry asking the Queen on a hunting weekend, shooting weekend, whether he could marry Meghan. Actually, if you don't know that story in Spare, it's quite interesting. So he's gone out for the shooting weekend and in the car on the way up there, um, William and, and Prince Charles are in the front. And Prince Charles chooses that time to basically complain that if he's intending to marry Meghan, that he can't afford to support her and that she should keep on acting. <laughs> So, but obviously what Prince Charles didn't realise was, was that um, Gina Northrop Cowan, her London agent, prior to meeting Harry, had more or less broken the news to Meghan that she couldn't find her anything, that things had dried up pretty severely and that there wasn't a lot on the horizon. So Charles, that was a dead end, love. There was no way that she was going to be able to support herself and her clothing budget through her acting. So he heads off to the shooting weekend, fully intending to ask the Queen for permission to ask Meghan to marry him because he'd been told by courtiers that being six in line to the throne, he had to ask the Queen. So on this shooting weekend, he bides his time, can't seem to, to get her alone at all. And then finally, at the end of the shoot, the queen is stomping out into the wet field in her wellies and her headscarf and collecting dead birds and with her dogs, her hunting dogs. So Harry grabs the opportunity and goes and joins Granny out in the field and, and uh, heads back to her lorry, not lorry, Land Rover, with the dead birds, one in each hand, and proceeds to say, Granny, I love Megan very much, and I've been told I have to ask you if, if I can ask her to marry me. And the Queen, tongue in cheek, says, well, I guess I'll have to say yes then. And then that sort of 
Harry's a bit dull, isn't he? He didn't pick up on it straight away and he was confused and thought she was playing word games and all it really required was a little little chuckle and, you know, anyway. <laughs> so that was that story. But Lady C's book points out that there were discussions prior with Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth. And you've probably heard reported that Prince Philip said uh, something along the lines of that we step out with actresses, but we don't marry them. Now, that sounds incredibly snobbish and everything, but Prince Philip wasn't being snobbish. He was actually being very practical. He was being practical from the point of view of Megan and her enjoyment of life and being practical for the point of view of Harry. Megan was coming into this like a brand ambassador rather than realising that being part of the royal family is not for, it's being an ensemble player. It's not about starring in anything. And I think she looked on the royal family as celebrity and was thinking that the queen was the star of the show and she's a bit old now and needed to be knocked off to the, <laughs> to the sidelines or something, I don't know. But royalty isn't that. It's not about starring. It's about steadfastness and duty and loyalty and all those boring things you've got to do and you've got to do them with a good attitude and you've got to do them over 70 years. Years. So Prince Philip had this view and, you know, not thinking that it was such a great idea, but he was all for Harry to have a, a grand love with Meghan, but he wanted him, of course, that if he was going to marry her, to, to give it longer, to let the differences and the difficulties and the things that could crop up to crop up and be dealt with over a period of time and then. So it get, got down to tin tacks and as Queen Elizabeth was expressing her um, caution, Harry just pretty much cut her off, cut her off, let it be known he didn't want to hear any more, thank you very much granny. And it was at that, that point that someone actually reiterated to Lady C that he said to Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth that they should be very careful if they were to block or not support this marriage because it could come across as racism. So as anyone who knows the royal family knows, that was ridiculous because that was the one thing that was highly in her favour. Being biracial was thrilling to Prince Philip and Queen Elizabeth. They were thrilled. They couldn't think of anything more wonderful uh, especially for the Commonwealth, they thought it was exciting and wonderful and that was the one thing firmly, firmly in her favour. The things that made her not in favour were the possibility of a past that could rise up and bite them both and make them very unhappy, which turned out to be true. The other thing that wasn't in their favour was the fact that she, she was quite dogmatic and um, they didn't think that she would be willing to sit back for long enough to learn the pitfalls and sort of the traps for young players. Also, they were worried about her highly political prior life because she was, you know, alarmingly left and uh, very strident in her political opinions. And that's fine if you're going to be an actress or a celebrity or a brand influencer or even just Harry's girlfriend, that's absolutely fine. It makes for very interesting dinner conversation. But it's not fine if you're going to be part of the royal family. Lady C came out with some really good advice in her book. And I almost feel like that if she had been hired by the palace to be advice, like a lady-in-waiting to Megan or something, I think she would have been an outstanding success because Lady C had the uncanny ability to identify the traps, to identify, I mean, even just simple things like 
you know, what Megan was wearing. You know, she she knew fashion. She knew the correct thing to wear at what time. She points out that Megan's first trooping of the colour was a misstep because she was basically wearing cocktail wear because it was off the shoulder. And so Lady C didn't care about that misstep, but she was saying it was a misstep that opened her up for attack. And again, she wore cocktail wear to that garden party, which I talk about in another video, where she wore transparent sleeves, which is only after five wear, things like that. Now, all this may seem petty and, and silly to those of us who, you know, don't live and work in a royal circle, but it matters because it opens you up for criticism. Another really good bit of Lady C advice was, Lady C said, if Meghan had a treated being Duchess of Sussex like a role after her marriage, she probably would have nailed it because she illustrates that on the suit set that she had a really good work ethic. And I've heard that before, that she had a really good work ethic and she was really good uh, part of the team. She, she was a good ensemble player because let's face it, in suits she was not a star. She was sort of fifth or sixth um, along in the ensemble, which is a little bit like Harry really, isn't it, in the royal family. The Duchess of Sussex role, Lady C points out, if she had have had that same attitude of treating it like an ensemble part, being part of the royal family. And you can actually see Harry try to set that up in the engagement interview because when Harry intimates that she's going to be a good part of the team and a good just join the team, be a good team player, Harry, uh, Harry didn't realise that Meghan did the quick Meghan Markle glare, that very definite glare. You know, we all know it the withering, icy stare. And I think he may have felt it burning into the side of his face because he did sort of blush from memory. But he was to experience that death grip and the glare a lot more over the years to come. Pretentious piffler with the depth of a teaspoon. That was how Lady C described the growing awareness amongst the press and also the royal family after Harry and Meghan's marriage that she was a pretentious piffler with the depth of a teaspoon. Okay, until next time, bye-bye.